Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's Hive event, where we'll be sharing with you our UK-wide campaign of support, um, our campaign supporting employers to pre prevent, address and tackle sexual harassment in the workplace. I'm Emma Tamplin. I'm the Collaboration Manager at Quaratig, and I'll be your host for today. It's so great to see so many people joining us. The uptake for the event has been incredible, and as we have such a large audience, we have deactivated your cameras and microphones today to minimise any disruptions um, throughout the talks. But if you have any questions, you can use the chat function and I will keep an eye on those and we can answer them as we go along. Um, we'll also circulate any presentations and a link to the recording after this event. Quaratig is the leading gender equality charity here in Wales and for 30 years we have been working to eradicate gender inequality. We work to ensure that women can enter the workplace, develop their skills and build rewarding careers. And we have a vision of a Wales where every woman and girl is treated equally, is able to fully participate in the economy and in public and political life and live safe from violence and fear. And at Quaratig, we offer a number of services that can help support girls, women and businesses across Wales. We also work closely with decision makers and government in Wales to ensure that our country is fair and inclusive for women and to ensure that they have a platform for their voices to be heard. We are a charity and you can help support the work that we do across Wales by visiting our website and clicking our donate button, which is on, which is on the top right hand side of the website. Your support will mean that we can help further the work that we do with girls and women building a fairer Wales for all. As mentioned, we have got a full programme for you today. We've got a lot to get through in the next two hours. I'll be giving an overview of the campaign and the support available for employers. We're then joined by my colleague, Joe Moorman, who will be running through the training materials that we have created for employers to use internally to train up your very own anti-sexual harassment pioneers. Joe has created a fantastic suite of resources for employers to use. We are also welcomed by um, Sarah Bray from South Wales Police, who will be sharing details of how they are leading the national approach to sexual harassment in policing. We then take a quick break at 10 past 11 before coming back to discuss intersectionality and why it's important to consider in the context of sexual harassment in the workplace. And that will be with Quaratig's Diversity and Inclusion Lead, Della Hill. And last but not least, we'll be rounding up today's event with Bob Hicks, our employer partner at Quaratig, and a trained ACAS investigator who will be sharing his experience and knowledge on banter versus sexual harassment in the workplace. And as mentioned, there will be an opportunity to ask any questions at the end of each presentation uh, using the chat function. And we'll, at any that we don't get to today, we'll reply offline and share those via email with you. So in a four nations approach to eradicating sexual harassment in the workplace, Quaratig has been working in partnership with the Fawcett Society in England, Close the Gap in Scotland and the Women's Resource Development Agency in Northern Ireland to create a suite of resources for employers to help them prevent, tackle and address sexual harassment in the workplace. The project was funded by Time's Up Justice and Equality Fund and is managed by Rosa. The project started with research on how employers, managers and women view their experiences of sexual harassment in the workplace. We then piloted the anti-sexual harassment pioneers training with employers in Wales, testing out resources and finding out what employers really need to be able to prevent, address and tackle sexual harassment in their workplaces. This all then um, helped to create the recently launched toolkit of employers uh, resources. The research carried out highlighted how widespread sexual harassment in the workplace really is. 52% 50, of women have experienced workplace harassment, that's one in two, and women who are marginalised for other reasons such as race or disability face an increased risk of different forms of sexual harassment. 68% of disabled women reported being sexually harassed at work. Two out of three LGBTQI plus people had experienced some form of sexual harassment in the workplace and ethnic minority workers, women and men, reported higher rates of sexual harassment than white workers. 
79% of people did not report unwanted sexual behaviour to their employer. And one in five reported that their manager or someone else with direct authority was the perpetrator. This underreporting is linked to a lack of support for women who do come forward, poor, work work, poor workplace processes for addressing complaints and concerns about the long term impact of reporting. Our Take Action Against Sexual Harassment campaign is aimed at employers. It is your duty to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace, uh, not the person experiencing it. And our campaign has five clear recommendations for employers, which are change, cu change the culture within your organisation, build inclusive cultures and workplaces that are diverse and equal by establishing a culture that challenges the idea that sexual harassment is a normal part of the workplace is a necessary first step in preventing sexual harassment. Create and implement a standalone sexual harassment policy and work with your employees to create that policy. Provide tailored training for all of your staff, starting with leaders. Carry out a climate survey to understand the hot spots and attitudes towards sexual harassment in your organisation and use the data from the climate survey to tailor training to the organisation. We recommend introducing robust reporting mechanisms, making it safe and easy to report and suggest offering multiple reporting routes, informal and formal. And we also recommend that you ensure you appropriately respond to reports of sexual harassment and treat employees who make a report with empathy and respect. Keep those reports confidential and provide managers with guidance and support in dealing with and investigating reports of sexual harassment. With all of this in mind, we have created a toolkit of employer focused resources, which have recently be, been launched. Um, these resources will help employers to be more proactive in their efforts towards eradicating sexual harassment in the workplace. The toolkit will help employers understand what is sexual harassment. It will provide you with the confidence and skills to tackle sexual harassment in your workplace and create harassment free cultures within your own organisations. The toolkit includes all of these documents, starting with the report, which has really great useful advice and guidance for employers. We also have a really great way to start guide as well, so that, that will talk you through the toolkit and where you need to start. Uh, we also have a climate survey for you to, to use within your organisation that will help you to measure your organisation's attitudes towards sexual harassment. We've also created a, a template sexual harassment policy for you to use as your guide. And we would recommend that you include employees in the development of your own policy and communi communicate that policy and regularly advertise it. We've also created a great video for you to use internally and some example campaign posters to help you create your own internal campaign. As previously mentioned, we have created some anti-sexual harassment pioneers training materials, which my colleague Joe will be going through shortly. And we've also created um, a list of great further support and guidance for employers that you can, you can read up on and access further, further knowledge. And we've also created support organisations and helplines for victims of sexual harassment in the workplace as well. And then lastly, we've also created a guide on intersectionality for employers, which my colleague Della will be running through with you a bit later on today. This toolkit is designed for you to be able to pick up and implement straight away, but we appreciate that some organisations may need a bit more support and we can help this with you and help you to embed this toolkit into your organisation. If you haven't yet received the toolkit, you can download this from our website. I will send um, the link back out after this session. I'm now going to hand you over to Joe, who's going to take you through the anti-sexual harassment pioneers training materials um, and help you to create your own anti-sexual harassment pioneers in your own organisation to drive that change forward. Joe, I'm going to hand over to you. I'll stop presenting. You're on mute, Joe. Hi, thanks Emma. Just bear with me while I share my slides. Hopefully it'll go smoothly. No problems. I'll keep an eye on the chat functions. If you do have questions, please pop them in and we can answer we can ask uh, Joe those questions at the end of her presentation. Brilliant. So as Emma explained, I am a training and qualifications development partner here at Quaratig and 
throughout the autumn, I was developing and piloting the ASH Pioneer training. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the toolkit, the resources that form part of the toolkit today. Um, so obviously you can see on the screen my email address if anyone does have any questions after as well. I'm more than happy to be contacted. So really, what is an ASH pioneer? Um, so the role of the anti-sexual harassment pioneer is to raise awareness of sexual harassment in the workplace and drive change within the organisation. Now, in practice, what that means is that the pioneer should be prepared to raise awareness through their organisation, through campaigns, newsletters, giving presentations, etc. They should be prepared to deliver source and advocate for comprehensive training for all employees. Um, whatever their role, however senior they are, everyone needs training in this area. They should be actively involved in reviewing the current situation. Um, promoting driving forward culture surveys and risk assessments so that actually we understand where our organizations are organizations are it's very hard to drive for change if we don't know where we're starting from um, they should also be prepared to challenge and provide constructive feedback and something i think perhaps Della may touch on a little more later as well interrogate their own privileges and bias because we need to make sure that we understand where intersectionality plays a role in sexual harassment and more than that we need to understand why we need an ash pioneer now the impetus of the program i think emma has covered brilliantly so far and really it has come from the government uh, legislation in 2021 where they committed for a duty to employees to prevent sexual harassment and following on from the campaigns from the Fawcett society the report that has just come out, um, it recognises it's about a culture within workplaces where everyday behaviour which violates the dignity of predominantly women is too often treated as acceptable banter. And this culture is actually upheld by the way many employers approach sexual harassment. They can seek to quietly resolve incidents after they've happened rather than preventing them in the, mid in the first instance. Um, and often it's an individual response to what is actually an institutional problem. And that can actually make things worse for employees who report sexual harassment, who can face victimisation and retaliation. And women often recognise this risk and choose not to report at all. And that can lead to a vicious cycle where actually managers and leaders don't know what's happening and don't have that clear picture of what the situation is. And policies where they exist sit on shelves unused and that means that despite the best intentions it can mean a lot of managers don't feel equipped in how to handle a sexual harassment complaint so altogether those environments can combine to make it very difficult for this problem to be recognized understood and tackled appropriately and there's actually now a regulatory need for employers to shift from an approach that seeks to minimise liability to one that seeks to create organisational cultures and norms that prevent sexual harassment. So that's kind of where this training sits. Um, and as Emma explained, it is built around these five key actions that have come out of the Fawcett Society report. And you'll see as I talk through how the programme works later on, we have tried to address each of these points and ensure that the ash um, pioneers are in a position to help address these areas so again we've touched a little bit on this but why is this training really so important um i know emma's just explained some of these statistics so she said 52 percent of women of all ages 63 percent of women aged 18 to 24 so younger women more at risk 68% of LGBTQ plus and 68% of disabled women, again, higher risk. And there's reasons for this. And I know Della will talk more about how intersectionality impacts later. But these findings are shocking. They paint a stark picture. And actually, they're probably just the tip of the iceberg. And the true figure is likely to be much more damaging. And also, I know these statistics to some extent focus on um, female respondents sexual harassment can happen to men 
And also, these statistics do not tell us anything about the sexual orientation or gender identity of the perpetrator. Anyone can commit sexual harassment and anyone can be a victim. And it's really important to remember that. And we, we talk about that a lot throughout the training. The other thing to think about is the situation around home working. The pandemic has caused significant changes to how we work. The move to home or remote working being one of the biggest, as well as the one that's likely here to stay, with organisations increasingly offering home working, either full time or in hybrid models. And you might think this change would have reduced instances of sexual harassment. However, escalations and new forms of harassment have been reported due to working from home. 45% of women in a recent survey reported experiencing the harassment online through sexual messages, cyber harassment, sexual calls, and women who've been sexually harassed said the harassment had increased or escalated since moving to home working at the start of the pandemic, so roughly one in five. Um, sorry, nearly one in four, actually. And then you take that a step further, like Emma mentioned, 79% do not report unwanted sexual behaviour. Uh, this is from a TUC report. And um, as the Fawcett Society identifies, a significant number of those who experience sexual harassment do not report it. The rights of women in 2021 20, survey, they found that nearly one in three women who've reported sexual harassment to their employer said the process had been negatively impacted by the pandemic. So we've got people who aren't reporting. We've got people where the reporting process is failing them. And we take that one step further, and we find that uh, two thirds, so 68% don't report to their employer. We find that one in four are, feel prevented from reporting to do fear of being outed in the workplace. And then we talk about perhaps people who have reported. So of all those who did report, sexual harassment instances to their employer, only 7% of white women felt that they had been dealt with satisfactorily. 0% of BME women had a satisfactory outcome. And again, this is something that Della will talk about more, but it really demonstrates a clear need for us to look at how we are understanding sexual harassment in the workplace, how we are putting reporting routes in place, how we are supporting staff to not just report, but how we are supporting our managers to investigate appropriately and feel confident in how they're dealing with these instances, because it isn't an easy subject. And people can feel like they are on the back foot. They don't always know how to go about this in a sensitive way. And all of this really does need to be taken further. And comments like the one on the slide now, they're not uncommon. This has come from the Fawcett Society report again, and there's quite a few comments on a similar line. Managers feeling they have no training. I feel out of their depth, ill-equipped to deal with such challenging and sensitive disclosures. And all of this builds our huge picture to support the need for training. And this programme that we've worked really hard on in the autumn has been built with both the statistics and the findings of the Fawcett report and these other studies at its centre. So what does the training actually look like? So for the ASH Pioneer training, we have three three hour sessions. The first one being um, an introduction to sexual harassment. And this focuses on understanding what sexual harassment is and the context in which it occurs. We explore how widespread sexual harassment is drawing on the statistics like those you've seen uh, and some others and considering what can be done to actually make reporting safer. We then talk about how organisational policies work. We encourage participants to review their own policies, um, possibly needing to construct one depending on, on where your organisation sits. And in light of good practice recommendations, we look at how policies can be changed, updated, how they can be communicated and how they can be actually embedded in the organisation. We talk about how you can conduct an investigation um, and the considerations around perhaps accessibility and training as well, because what you'll find is although in the third section we talk about building inclusive cultures, it is a theme that runs through all the three sessions. Um, 
But in that final session, we do focus more on ensuring participants understand the crucial role inclusive culture plays in tackling sexual harassment and consider how culture change can actually be achieved. So we know there may be additional training that is needed around some of this. Uh, we focus very much on for the Ash Pioneers on um, embedding the policy, but we know that, for example, managers who might be investigating um, or receiving complaints, they might need additional support that you'll need to consider as well. Things like um, empathetic listening and um, conduct uh, to, to make sure that they can receive this information effectively. The other thing that was really important to us is to make sure that the sessions were actually interactive. Now, I know that I've been talking at you a little, but we want the actual sessions to be as interactive as possible. Um, while we know the topics can be challenging, it was really important to me to open up discussions and create a safe space where people could reflect on their own biases and challenges, as well as those of their organisation's policies, in order to bring about real change. And they were excellent discussions in the pilot, I have to be honest, because they generated new ideas, they changed perceptions, and they allowed us to learn from each other. I learned from the wonderful people who joined us, and hopefully they all learned from us as well. And to support this, we included a mixture of activities. Uh, we used anonymous polls, we used interactive whiteboards, obviously, because we, we're still online, um, breakout rooms, discussions, case studies, and like I say, all of this is out of necessity being designed for online delivery, but we've made sure to build in the flexibility that it would still work with some minor adaptations in the classroom as well. And we wanted this resource to be flexible to the change in situation. Um, so there are notes alongside the resources as well that suggest how these things can be can be worked to so adapted and personalised. So we know um, you might wish to adapt the sessions based on, for example, the number of participants you're working with, the time allocated, the type of organisation or the sector or geographical location or how involved with unions your organisation is, because there might be some additional very specific information to your organisation that you want to include. Um, so it might be very open to things like you might want to increase timeframes because you want longer discussions or because you've got a larger group. You might want to change perhaps some of the images to reflect your sector or some of the statistics. If you've got um, statistics from your own organisation already, you might want to involve some of those. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility here in how you can use the resources to best suit yourselves. And like I say, we've put in some guidance to sort of help you think about how that might work for you. Um, and then following that, what we really want is for you to embed and run with this training. So we would expect that the toolkit would work with training for the Ash pioneers. Um, investigate, find out what the situation is by conducting those culture surveys and completing a risk assessment for sexual harassment. There are templates for those in the toolkit that are really there for you to use. And then really, the Ash Penny, we want, we want you and your organisations to act on the results, to make concrete changes. And one of the biggest ones of those may be find appropriate and specific training for all employees. Now, this will differ based on the role. Uh, all will need baseline information to understand what sexual harassment is and the organisation's policy and procedure. But those involved with investigations receiving reports, they might need more detailed instruction to fulfil their roles. And like I mentioned earlier, they might require specific uh, training in skills areas such as empathetic listening and conscious bias training, etc. And you also need to conduct sort of when, um, consider when you conduct that training. So for me, the logical thing to do would be to train, make sure your Ash pioneers are in place, but you train your staff based on the results of your culture surveys, your risk assessments, you train them to use the policy that has been adapted to be part of good practice, because then you can help tie all that together into building a culture. And you also need to remember that this is not a one-off 
none of this is a one-off activity what we want everyone to do is to commit to making long-term change that you recognize that sexual harassment might actually need to form part of your compliance training to ensure that everyone remains up to date on the policy in place any legislation changes so that this actually forms a regular discussion within your workplace and then people become more comfortable with what is expected of them and how their actions can impact other people and more than that obviously um it is really about making a commitment to changing attitudes and behaviors and this can be difficult and, and as emma mentioned earlier quality can be here to support you with that um so really i know that's a bit of a whistle stop tour so if anyone has any questions by all means i will stop sharing uh, so that i can see those questions and if anyone has any please let me know i know emma you may have some or may not otherwise i will hand over to um sarah who is joining us from south wales police thank, thank you, you. Josh, for that run through um yeah we will be welcoming our guest speaker sarah bray now who's going to be sharing her experiences of the campaigns they've been running internally and across policing you know across the uk um, but if any anybody does think of any questions please pop them in the, the questions tab um, or if something comes to your mind a bit later, just drop us an email. You've got our details and we can answer those offline. Um, Sarah, we're going to hand over to you now. Oh, hang on. We have a question, actually. Do you deliver the ASH training or is the toolkit designed so that we self-deliver as an organisation? Um, the answer, Rose, is both. You can deliver the training yourself. We've created the training materials and there's very thorough um, notes for presenters in the toolkit for you to be able to pick this up and do yourself. Or if you do need a bit more support, you can um, contact Quartig and we can look at how we can better support you with that. I hope that answers your question. Joe, do you have anything else to add to that? No, I think that was perfect. Um, and okay. I think that's where we said hopefully the, the materials are comprehensive and and but obviously not everyone would feel comfortable and we are there to support if if needed absolutely you you know you may not have in-house trainers yourselves that can pick this up and deliver and you know absolutely get in touch with us and we can support you with that um but it is designed for you to be able to use yourselves um sarah do we have sarah we do good morning everyone fantastic is your camera working sarah and then i'm going to try and put it on yes it is there i am Perfect. there we go over to you Thank you so much. I'm just going to share my screen, but thank you so much for inviting me today. Really grateful to be able to share the work that we've done here in South Wales uh, with you all and um, to talk about how you'll hear very quickly how passionate I am about this. So um, I'll just get stuck into the presentation and please any questions and I'll share my email in the chat function as well. So should you want to pick anything up with me afterwards, you are more than welcome. But can I just get a shout that you can see this OK? Yeah, all looks good, Sarah. Perfect. OK, so this is just a very quick run through of the work that we undertook in South Wales Police with Huarateg and then how that evolved into some of our national work and how South Wales are taking a lead on this for all police forces nationally so that we make um, policing a far safer environment for everyone where everybody can come to work and be treated with dignity and respect. So the background for policing is a little different. Um, this was probably just around the time of the Me Too movement. But actually, it was prompted by a survey undertaken by Unison, the LSE and the University of Surrey into sexual harassment in policing by police staff or the experience of police staff. It was a startling report where something like one in five had experienced inappropriate touching, two in five had experienced um, uh, intrusive questioning around their sex lives. I think three and five had witnessed or experienced sexual harassment themselves. Now in Welsh policing, we've got our Welsh chief officer group where all our chief constables come together of the four Welsh forces and meet regularly. And after this report came out, they got together and said, is this an issue for us? So they decided to commission Huarateg to come into each of the four forces to undertake a series of focus groups, just to start to lift the rock really and see is this an issue not just for police staff but for police officers or is this a very england centric issue sorry all my notifications coming up there um so 
During that time, our National Police Chiefs Council Ethics Committee had started some work around sexual harassment to create an action plan, and our College of Police had also started to develop some work on this. So Huarte came in, ran a series of focus groups for us, and South Wales were the first to receive their report and the first to act on it. Our plan initially was to bring the four Welsh forces together so we could share our findings and look at an all Wales reproach. However, COVID happened and that kind of slid out of the way. So we were really keen that as a force, we didn't wait until we could all get together. We just wanted to crack on with our findings because as I said, they were stark. So what did we find? What did Hwaratig find? Hwaratig found that most participants were able to identify sexual harassment and felt culture had improved in recent years. However, when we started digging into that in the focus groups, we actually found that people had become desensitised to sexual harassment and had accepted it as normal workplace banter. We saw a lot of light bulb moments through that, where people then said, actually, yes, we have experienced sexual harassment in the workplace, or we've witnessed it in relation to others. They were able to identify multiple ways of reporting, but they identified so many that it was just confusing. Many were, and the overwhelming majority had trust in the force to deal with allegations of sexual harassment, but many were concerned about actually raising it in the first place. They were concerned about being seen as a troublemaker, about rocking the boat, of being alienated from their teams, of being alienated from wider colleagues and also the impact it would have on their careers. We're an organisation of six and a half thousand, but we are all close. We pretty much all know each other. And there was a real concern that should you raise this, it would just follow you throughout your career. Most felt the reports were taken seriously, but the, there's a significant barrier to the time taken to investigate complaints. Um, we have a very thorough professional standards department which investigates complaints internally and externally into policing uh, or into policing of South Wales Police. And it takes time to investigate because they are thorough investigations. And as you can imagine, when you're when a complainant is externally, the impact is is great, but not so great that you're bumping into them in the corridor. But of course, for an internal investigation, that's even more nuanced. And many felt actually that whilst we dealt with sexual harassment, there was um, an outcome known as management action, which is basically a supervisor telling someone off. They didn't feel that reflected the severity of the accusations or that it impacted someone's career or behaviour enough for it to be a deterrent. Quality made some recommendations for us, some very um, clear and probably obvious recommendations and exactly what uh, both Joe and Emma have gone through just now. Educate the workforce on sexual harassment with a clear message and expectations. Encourage a victim focused approach, outlining the outcome options to give confidence to those who wish to report. We hear an awful lot, I don't want someone to lose their job. And I'll come back to that a little later, but it's definitely a deterrent. Whereas if you're able to explain the various outcomes for a sexual harassment investigation, of which there are many, not just sacking someone, it gives a little bit more reassurance. Uh, raise an awareness of how to report and how to access support for the process, and to give training to supervisors to have confidence to deal with complaints of sexual harassment, and to review the complaints process. Can we speed it up and can we make it a little easier and a, a lot less painful? And can we appoint sexual harassment box or single points of contact? Anybody who watches Line of Duty will know we love an acronym. So I do apologise if there's some in here that um, that might confuse you. Just pop them in the chat and I'll explain them later. So we didn't appoint sexual harassment single points of contact. And it was due to pushback from our federation, our police federation, which is the police union, as well as our uh, trade unions of Unison and GMB. The reason being, when there is a an investigation into something such as sexual harassment or a complaints investigation, the investigative landscape is quite cluttered. You have the individual who's been complained against and the complainant, if it's internal, you have their various line managers, you have their various trade union support, you have the professional standards investigator, and you have the SMT. We also have what we call welfare support officers who provide support to those under investigation or going through an investigation as a complainant, um, where we talk to those support officers, give them support from a welfare point of view. Only that, they don't get involved in the investigation, they just signpost them to health and wellbeing support because, as I said, it's an incredibly painful and difficult process. 
So the Fed Federation and Union said, look, there's too many people in that. And if we get, you know, if we get Spox in this as well, it's going to be a disaster for us. There's just too many. So what we did, we provided enhanced training to the Gender Equality Network, of which I am chair, um, to the uh, Police Federation members to our, um, our trade unions of GMB and Unison and as part of our sexual harassment toolkit which will come on to a little later we've got a link of not sure if this crosses the line get in contact with these people so in a way we are Spocks but we don't get involved in the investigation anyway so it's a long long explanation of why we didn't go with Spocks I apologize I don't want as part of this to lose the things the women said to us during the focus groups. So I've put up a couple of things that we heard because I think they're really impacted. These are not the worst things we heard in those focus groups or in the subsequent work afterwards. It's just the ones I think we were able to share here. So there are so many derogatory terms used to describe female officers, such as chaps with flaps. I've been followed around the station by a male colleague. He's even booked on the same courses as me. He's everywhere I turn. I am careful what clothes I wear to work. They're always baggy and loose fitting as I feel the comments about my chest. I was told I didn't get promoted because she was clearly fitter than you. And when I challenged that, I was told to stop being so emotional. And is it your time of the month? And if you challenge, you get labelled as a mouthy bitch. Watch her, she's a troublemaker. And something happened to me. I was so taken aback, I didn't do anything. I was shocked. I just couldn't believe it had happened. Then I started to doubt myself. Then I started to feel guilty I hadn't spoken up. And then I worried that no one would believe me. So you can see why when we got our report, we wanted to do something quickly. So what do we do? Southwest Police, we created a task and finish group, which brought together key players in this. So the Gender Equality Network, Federation, Unions, HR, um, the Professional Standards Department, our, uh, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Team, Corporate Services, all, you know, the, the kind of, the kind of obvious people that we would bring together and it was chaired by our assistant chief constable mark travis which is a really really senior level in policing you've only got the dep and the chief above them so this was taken on at a very senior level within the organization we developed the first sexual harassment policy in policing internal and the first sexual harassment toolkit for victims and supervisors we undertook a review of our learning and development interventions. Where were we talking to people about sexual harassment? We know we discuss it with them when they come in as probationers, um, as brand new officers. But where else were we discussing this? Were we discussing our supervisory training? Were we discussing it in our equality and diversity training? We found we weren't. So we started to slot in inputs on sexual harassment at regular points throughout someone's career. We looked at the reporting process and we streamlined those options down to three key options. We have a police integrity line, which is run by Crime Stoppers and is completely independent and is something I can't push enough. I need to wear a sandwich board with the details on because it's a phenomenal tool. And that's the first place I send people if they want to report something and they can report as much as they like without being identified themselves or um, because it helps even if they just know something has happened in a local area. They may not know the full details of who or what or why. It's enough. That report will come into our professional standards department via Crime Stoppers. And it's enough to know that there's an issue possibly in this area of the force, which means we can look at it against trend analysis of our internal complaints or external complaints and see if there's an issue there so we can target an intervention. We also developed a number of professional standards interventions. Uh, again, we like an acronym, but we also like an operation name. So we had Operation Ninian and Operation Oak, and I'll tell you all about those in a moment. We also created a targeted communications campaign. We support the He For She programme in South Wales Police, and I had my male He For She champions saying those very words that I just said to you out loud on behalf of other women, and they spoke it in first person, which is really startling to hear men say things such as, I, I wear loose fitting clothes for fear of comments about my chest or I was told don't be so emotional because men wouldn't say that um, and it's a campaign that has been taken nationally and evolved by other forces into into some really good stuff such as the not in my force campaign that you may have seen on social media so operation Ninian what's that operation Ninian was a professional standards department program where they went out and spoke to all frontline supervisors they've hit about 
think about 600 so far and they go and they talk to them not just about sexual harassment it's a broader piece of work where we talk to supervisors around uh, areas of risk for counter corruption so there's not just sexual harassment or abusive position for sexual purposes. There's also things like notifiable associations, uh, financial irregularities, those kind of things that can make people more open to, to corruption. It's a brilliant session where they go and talk to them about why people complain internally and externally and what they as supervisors can do to create a healthy team culture. Feedback from this intervention has been phenomenal. Um, our supervisors have been saying we've been screaming for this for so long. Um, thank you so much. We've seen a 650% increase in notifiable associations and a 300% increase in reporting to our anti-corruption unit on issues of concern. We also created in development with the Gender Equality Network, Operation Oak. These operations bear no, uh, no correlation at all to the purpose. They automatically generated, I think, by a system somewhere. Uh, but Operation Oak targeted teams with less than 30% female representation. Uh, of which we had something like 30 teams in South West Police without, uh, with less than 30% female representation. Some had less than 10% female representation. And we go in with professional standards department and we talk to supervisors about healthy team cultures and we talk to them about potential, potential signs to look out for around vulnerability to sexual harassment and sexual misconduct and questions the supervisors can pose to their teams or to themselves to see if they've got an issue. The emphasis is very much on the need to maintain healthy team cultures and identify learning, not necessarily punitive behaviours or punitive interventions. So I went to um, our national gender board um, well, after we had done all this work and said uh, anybody else doing anything because we've I think we've done as much as we can and we knew our other fellow Welsh forces hadn't really caught up with us yet because we had just pushed on with this work independently and at that at that meeting I think there was about 38 forces represented and honestly I had about 35 of them contact me afterwards to say so we're not doing anything but can, can we look at this together please because I think what you've done there in South Wales is great and we'd like to steal it and together we'd like to do more. So that resulted in our ACC Mark Travis becoming the national lead for sexual misconduct and abusive position for sexual purposes. And we undertook a whole host of work nationally with those forces that step forward to support this work to see what are the issues. We linked up with Bournemouth University who have done phenomenal work on this area in policing uh, with masses of research. And we just saw actually some real common key issues that there is a lack of understanding by all genders around sexual harassment and that there's a really high level of tolerance for what constitutes sexual harassment and inappropriate behaviour. There are clear areas of vulnerability of what makes someone vulnerable to this behaviour and actually victim confidence and bystander behaviour are very, very closely linked. I get really passionate about bystanders in a very uh, pointed way uh, and I'll come to that a little later but I've started to realise it's driven by the same issues that our victims see in terms of coming forward that fear of being isolated by the team that fear of being stigmatised that feeling of ruining your career or ruining someone else's career I hear that so much they're a really nice person other than this awful awful behaviour um, and people are reluctant to then bring down a, you know, 30 years worth of a career as a result of some some inappropriate behaviour. So Bournemouth University gave me some of this data of some things that they looked at in a couple of forces. So in a sample of 163 cases that they undertook nationally, 96.32% of the victims were female with 97% of a male perpetrator, showing this is very much a gender issue. 42% uh, were under 30, 46% were considered vulnerable, and I'll come to what vulnerability means in a moment. 63% saw the experience use of sexual language and harassment, and 44% had been physically sexually assaulted. Now, just a quick point on the South Wales Police focus groups. I wasn't chair of the Gender Equality Network then, and I wasn't, I wasn't part of the development of the focus groups. My next round of work on this, I would have loved to have done uh, focus groups with our male colleagues, but I would have loved to focus with our LGBT network and with our Black Police Association. I know that from um, 
certainly with Black Police Association colleagues, that we are seeing more issues for Black female officers. And I know that we are seeing more issues from anecdotal evidence from those who are LGBT, both male and female. Um, so that's a set kind of phase two for us now in South Wales. And it's something that we're really pushing other forces to do, to engage broadly across their networks um, to look at the intersectionality issues. And I'm so sorry I can't see the intersectional piece later because I'd be really fascinated to hear the, the findings on that. There's some other things here that we found nationally. Um, these are some of the things that are being said in other forces. They would wheel their chairs over to me and ask how I masturbated my boyfriend, what I used on myself, how often I had sex and how my boyfriend liked it. All their language, their questions, all of them apart from probably two were asking me and it was just non-stop. I just didn't want to go to work. And this one breaks my heart. It was a massive passion that was taken away from me, but it's the first thing I've ever had to walk away from, to be honest with you, and not complete. I always go above and beyond in everything I do, so to not complete what I went in there to do, which was to support victims and staff and stuff, it's a shame it's come to this. Women are leaving policing, a service I am so passionate about, and I am seeing them walk away because of this behaviour. The vulnerability, what makes people vulnerable to this? We've talked about age a little. We see that there's younger women stepping forward. My concern is, is that the older women are just more immune to it, just got a far higher level of tolerance because they've been experiencing it for 30 odd years. And I do wonder whether their experiences of it is the same. And again, why the intersectional intersectional piece later might be might shed some light on that. Uh, we've got some traditional vulnerability factors. And what we call vulnerability in terms of policing often links to things like mental health, adverse childhood experiences and so on. If you've had experience of domestic abuse or sexual abuse, you're more likely to experience this behaviour. And where there's an area of power imbalance, policing is a very rank orientated structure, orientated structure. And we are seeing, whereas before it would have been unheard of maybe for a PC to report directly into a chief inspector. We see in that happen more because of small project teams, change programs, uh, those kind of things evolving where those people may come together and there's a little bit of abuse of power issues there. Gender balanced teams we touched upon, we do see that there, there is far more likely to be sexual harassment in a team if they have less than 30% female representation. And lawn working, as Joe mentioned earlier, um, we, the first force to raise it with me saw it because they were staggering shifts and they were ensuring that um, maybe one or two people coming into the station together at the same time um, rather than whole teams of five or six. They were staggering their shifts and were seeing this kind of play its way out. We also saw that online people were more likely to be fishing. Um, we recently put someone through the misconduct process and they left the organisation for... Um, fishing using our online systems over 60 women internally um, and no victims came forward on that we found that as part of our anti-corruption unit surveillance um, which picks up on common words or themes in emails and uh, we were able to take this individual forward through the misconduct process because of course someone emails you a bit out of the blue and is a bit flattering you wouldn't think of reporting that as sexual harassment perhaps you just and Pepe Le Pew type behaviour and you would just delete the email. They weren't aware that they were doing that to so many other women. And significant life changes is a fascinating one for me because it was one I heard all the time anecdotally from my members of the Gender Equality Network. And it was borne out by Bournemouth University uh, research. Things such as marriage breakdowns, divorce, menopause and return from maternity makes women far more susceptible to this behaviour. If they are breastfeeding and they're returning from maternity, they're even more likely to experience this behaviour. Um, now, there's a couple of things for that. Is it just a boob thing, um, as, as has been put forward by Bournemouth? Or is it that actually women, when they're breastfeeding, tend to lose a lot of weight? There's a different kind of feel of, of how you see yourself and so on. But those significant life changes are the things that absolutely fundamentally change how we feel about, as ourselves as women. And so there's an opportunity for people to play upon that vulnerability. And bystander behaviour. We've done an awful lot of work to understand bystander behaviour in policing. Um, it's the thing that really gets me going because we will stand shoulder to shoulder in riots and protests. And yet the minute something like this happens in a team or in a canteen or in a van, everybody turns deaf, dumb and blind. They don't know. They haven't heard it. They don't know. They haven't heard anything. 
I wasn't there, I was on the toilet or I was making a phone call. And suddenly we turn, turn our backs on a victim. And it's taken me a long time to realise that actually that behaviour isn't always malicious. It's not because they actively want to cause more harm to a victim, which was my first inclination, um, but it's often because of those things that they fear, exactly what the victim fears, that long-term career impact, that isolation and stigmatisation. So what do negative bystander be behaviours look like? Well, they ignore the behaviour or the concerns of the victim and they don't offer help and support. The really common one is to undermine concerns that they're overreacting or somehow invited the behaviour and or discourages them from reporting. That point often comes from a place of good. I've seen lots of people say to them, look, you don't want to raise that now. That's going to cause you such issues in the long term. You're better off just trying to move out of the department or move out of the team. That's coming from a place of care for the victim, but it's misplaced. Or someone who suspects abuse or inappropriate behaviour is happening, but consciously does nothing to help. So we try to move that into positive upstander behaviour, using our he for she champions to talk about practical things people can do, diverting attention away, deflecting perpetrators, calling out poor behaviours, supporting victims by removing them from the situation, checking on their welfare, or in just ensuring that they remain included and engaged and they still feel a little bit of that team love. We have uh, Team SWP is a kind of most common hashtag, I guess, in the organisation. We pride ourselves on our family feel. We pride ourselves on feeling like one big family and really tapping into that behaviour for this and saying, you know, if this happened to someone in your family, surely you, you wouldn't turn your back. And more importantly, we encourage them to report their concerns. If they're unsure a line has been crossed, get in touch with us or just put it on the police integrity line, that anonymous line, no matter how much information you want to share, put it in there because our professional standards department will still be able to do something even if it's just mapping certain behaviours in a certain area that allows us to bring those interventions that we talked about earlier. We also add in some further upstander tips. Mum was encouraging the men in the organisation to become he for she champions. Uh, we talk about listening to lived experiences and also doing your own work on this. Um, I get men coming to me all the time going, say, what can I do? What can I do to help? And I always get cries for, um, can we get any victims in to talk to us? Absolutely, fundamentally not. I will not parade victims to go through the further emotional labour of talking about this. Um, I come and I'll tell you about it, rather than put that burden on others. But there is so much out there for people to look at. You know, you've only got to go onto YouTube and there's brilliant TED Talks on there around the everyday sexism stuff. There's brilliant... Um, resources from things like he for she from, such as Quadratig, you know business in the community doing some great work on this too there's so much out there challenging your own perceptions which i know joe mentioned earlier as part of the uh, the work that Quadratig are encouraging and a one for me for supervisors at all levels whether you are um, a director or a ceo or you are a frontline supervisor owning the culture you create owning the culture you often inherit and owning the culture that you create and ensuring that it, it stays long after you leave. And that's done by ensuring people understand why this is important. Why does this need to be important for us? Why should everybody be treated with dignity and respect in the workplace? They seem like daft questions to us, I know, because I think we're probably all on the same page. But we do have colleagues who struggle with that. Cascade the message, talk about this regularly, talk about healthy team cultures and dignity and respect. If you're uncomfortable talking about sexual harassment in the very blunt terms I tend to talk about it, then you can talk easily about dignity and respect for each other. And this is less, all these kind of tips are just as applicable across all the protected characteristics and not just for gender or sex. Language is powerful. Um, there's a little bit of language police at times um, around you know, uh, there was, I saw some guidance recently from one police force, you know, don't say, come on guys. And I know, you know, that certainly has its place for sure. Absolutely. In policing, I don't think that's what the women are worried about. They're more worried about the things like, oh, is it your time of your month? Do you, you know, is that why you're so emotional? Um, not for the minutes, love. And uh, go make the tea, girls. That kind of thing. It's more about the gender stereotypes that tend to catch us out and tend to rile us rather than perhaps more common language, perhaps. Um, and be a sponsor, be a sponsor for women in the workplace, not just a coach, not just a mentor, someone who talks in our defence, in our support and in our development um, when we're not even in the room. 
We've got some key enablers that we talk about in policing too. So Maggie Blythe is a deputy chief constable who's in charge of the violence against women and girls work nationally. You may have seen her in the press and she's created a national framework for violence against women and girls around these three key areas, trust and confidence in policing, safer spaces and pursuing perpetrators. So the work that we develop in nationally, we are using those themes because they are just as applicable internally as they are externally. Trust and confidence in policing will only ever come when we treat each other with dignity and respect. So we're talking about strong leadership and organisational awareness there. Make sure that people know this behaviour is not acceptable. If we find it, you will be out to the organisation. Creating safer spaces. I think for me, bystander behaviour, one of the key issues there is psychologic, psychological safety. People don't feel safe to step forward and complain about inappropriate behaviour or to say that they've witnessed it. And I think psychological safety in teams is really, really key. My day job is internal engagement manager, so I talk a lot about this um, in a broader sense. And if you've got safe environments, it's not just harassment that'll, you know, that'll significantly decrease or, um, you know, issues around the other protected characteristics, but also you'll see improvements in mental health. People will be more comfortable to step forward and say, actually, I don't feel great right now. I'm really struggling uh, from a professional standards perspective it'll certainly improve for us too because people tend to make mistakes when they're not well or when they're going through significant issues at home personally professionally and if they are working in a kind of safe environment where they can step forward and say look I need to talk to you about something we'd all be better off and pursuing perpetrators robust and supportive action for both per perpetrators of this behavior and our victims that voice and a choice of a victim to be centric to our approach there's some wicked issues in policing at the moment, which I won't go into too heavily because I'm really conscious of time because I can talk a lot, as you can probably tell. There are the broader cultural perceptions around gender, which have been around for millennia and not, you know, I'm trying to avoid a, a ranty feminist uh, soapbox moment, but they'll be far broader than what we've seen in our current organisations. Impact of public perception about policing is really difficult too. Um, we have phenomenal frontline officers. I work with brilliant people who just feel brutalized at the moment um, and I think that can cause a bit of a pushback against the equality diversity and inclusion agenda sometimes and we know in policing uh, we have a national well-being survey that runs and it's marked in some areas around public service motivation and emotional energy we know emotional energy is dropping our frontline are exhausted and a lot of the middle management and senior management by the way are absolutely exhausted but we've seen a fall in public service motivation, which is the thing that keeps me awake at night. We're not here for the Lamborghinis and the mansions. We're here for the greater good. That's the same way I come to work. And if that's fallen amongst us, that's really worrying. And I know that's being seen across the whole of public service at the moment. So next steps for us nationally. We've got a national survey that we've developed with our police federation and with our um, academic colleagues where we are really drilling into victim behaviour, bystander behaviour and perpetrator behaviour. We are publishing the first national strategy and the first national policy, which is an enhanced version of the one we created in South Wales and which is something that uh, police forces can adopt and adapt locally. We're creating an intervention toolkit, pulling together things like Operation Indian, Operation Oak, as well as the other brilliant interventions that are happening in other forces, and pulling them all into one toolkit, where whether you are, um, you know, a chief superintendent in charge of an enormous division, or whether you are a frontline supervisor who's worried about culture in their teams, there'll be interventions within that toolkit that you can draw down and, um, and progress. And we're also working on an evidence-based communication campaign. This is the one that fascinates me. We went really hot and heavy on our He For She campaign around this work. Um, it was everywhere, posters everywhere, all over our internet, brilliant videos, uh, chief officers talking about it, senior leaders talking about it, absolutely brilliant. We were really proud of ourselves, big slaps on the back. And then we run our, uh, our PC, police constable, to sergeant promotion. Now, there's a lot of people who go through that every year. And so we run six different panels across the force. And we run it over a week. And we put a question in there um, for this work, which was, a member of your team comes to you to complain about the level of sexualized banter in the team. What do you do? And on the Friday afternoon, I had three separate chairs of those panels ring me independently of each other to say, sir, we've got an issue here. They don't get it. Responses to the question included things such as, mm, well, first of all, I'd have to see if I believed her. 
Well, number one, thank you for genderizing the question for us. And number two, if I put racist language, if I put homophobic language, would that be your response? Of course it wouldn't, because you would have gone ding, ding, ding. This is an EDI question. I need to trot out my diversity and inclusion response. But because it was, you know, sex and gender, it's like, gosh, oh, it was a problem child issue. It was treated as a as a teen dynamic issue. Other responses were, well, some people are just a bit sensitive, so I'll probably have a chat with them about personal resilience. Or maybe I'd have to go and have a chat and see where the line is in the team. So that really, really worried us. And as this was happening, I was get, I picked up the phone and rang a couple of um, couple of colleagues in other forces who are working on this with us nationally and who have done amazing com comms campaigns and said, is this driving up reporting for you? Is there a change in behaviour for you? And none of them could say that there were. So we've engaged some academics from Cardiff University and um, from Bournemouth, and there's another one I can't remember off the top of my head, and the College of Policing, to look at what works internally in policing to change behaviour. Uh, what works for victims to help them step forward, what works for bystanders for them to step up and play a role, and what works with perpetrators. And I'm really excited for what that work's gonna, gonna bring forward. We're currently doing a pilot with the academics to look at what we've done in South Wales versus what's happening in the Met Police who are part of this work too. They've got a brilliant chief superintendent who's dealing with this uh, for the Met, and we are gonna pull our two comms campaigns together and they're gonna be fully uh, fully looked at and explored and new interventions tested to see what works for comms. So my message there is just because it feels impactive and it feels a bit shocking doesn't mean it's going to change behaviour and you need to test the behaviour has changed as a result of that. And I think that's it really. There's some final reflections there and I can share this presentation with you. Um, I just talk a lot about healthy team cultures and I talk a lot about dignity and respect rather than keep hammering, the, hammering this as perhaps a sex issue I guess. But Conscious I've talked at you all for so long. I'm so sorry. I shall stop sharing. Any questions, of course. Thank you, Sarah, for that honest and open account of your experiences and you know what your your organisation is doing to tackle sexual harassment in the workplace and some very honest accounts there. So I really do appreciate you sharing that with us and taking the time to join us today. If anybody does have any questions, please pop them in the chat uh, function and we will reply as soon as we can. I've just seen one come through now. Fantastic presentation, Sarah. Delighted with progress. How does S, uh, South Wales Police enforce zero tolerance? What's your advice to those organisations who struggle to demonstrate zero toler tolerance? Oh, Wendy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Wendy, of course, being, um, I was going to say an old friend, but that, uh, Wendy's a wonderful friend um, who I've known a long time and um, really, really great question. I think zero tolerance is really tough to achieve in the position that we're in at the moment. All we can keep doing is keep reinforcing the messaging through our supervisory training, through our chief officers and through the work that we are now looking to do in the comms campaign. And I think you have to follow that up with robust, um, robust pursuing of perpetrators. People have to see that this behaviour is not tolerated um, because you can create a message of zero tolerance, but if people only get a slap on the wrist as a result of this behaviour, then you're not going to get very far. You have to have, unfortunately, some really public sackings, um, which we've certainly seen recently in the last 12 months for, for South Wales Police. I think as well, there's the really interesting thing around the voice and the choice. And this is where I come unstuck a little. And I know Wendy and I have had conversations on this. Mark Travis is really keen on voice and a choice. But women will often just say, I don't want anything to happen. I just want the behaviour to stop. And that's great, right? <laughs> the problem is you've got to think about those coming behind you. And that if you don't pursue this sometimes, you're not protected and not just the women coming behind you who may have to work with these individuals, but the women in our communities who are being dealt with by these individuals. And I've got a really strong message I say every time. Reporting sexual harassment does not ruin someone's career. Their behaviour does. Reporting sexual harassment in the workplace does not ruin someone's reputation. It makes it a far more accurate representation of who they are. And reporting sexual harassment in the workplace does not make you a bitch or a challenger. It makes you abide by the code of ethics, which in policing binds you to challenge inappropriate behaviour for yourself and for others. It's something you have to do. Um, so I get really caught up sometimes in that, in that, I think zero tolerance would be far easier um, 
in terms of a comms and messaging campaign at times, but we may not bring victims with us. Does that make sense? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah, for that. For that. Um, does anybody else have any questions for Sarah before we head to the break? If you do, then we can, um, yeah. you know, we can we can pass those on to Sarah to answer off uh, offline. And we can get back to you. Um, Hi, Sarah, is South Wales Police accredited by White Ribbon UK? Yeah, we are. Yes, we are. We, I think we only came to quite late to that accreditation. Um, but we came to it this year, I believe, or maybe last year as part of the um, as part of the White Ribbon Awareness Day. I know there's a lot of forces. There was a request out, I think, from the National Police Chiefs Council as well to make sure the forces were all signed up. So we signed up back. It was definitely last year because it was prior to the, the White Ribbon Day. Thanks, Sarah. OK, we're going to head off for a quick 10 minute break now. I know that we've given you a lot of information so far for this first half of the session. So please go fill yourselves up, top yourselves up with your drinks and um, yeah, join us in about uh, 10 minutes where we'll be coming back and hearing from my colleague Della Hill around intersectionality and how it relates to sexual harassment in the workplace. Thank you everybody for the first half and thank you to our great guest speakers, to Joe for sharing the training materials and to the wonderful Sarah Bray as well. Really uh, appreciate you taking the time to join us today and I'll see you all very, very shortly. Go have a break. Thank you, bye bye. Let's pop the program back up for you and um, just to remind you of what we have uh, coming up. So I'll shortly be handing over to Della Hill um, and then we'll be um, rounding up today's event then with Bob Hicks looking at Banton versus sexual harassment um, and then we'll close at 12 with any final questions that you may have for us um, but if anything does pop into your mind a bit later please do drop us an email. Um, I'll now hand you over to Della who's going to share her screen. Thank you very much. Just going to press the present button. Here we go. Fab. Can everybody see my screen? I think that yes. Loaded. Fab. Thank you very oh, much, Anna. Thank you. Um, so my name is Della Hill and I'm the Diversity and Inclusion Lead at Quarateg. Um, and I'm going to be giving you an overview today on what intersectionality is and why it's too, um, important to consider in the context of sexual harassment within the workplace. Um, and like the other previous presentations, there should be a bit of time for questions. Um, so pop them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them as we move along. So as part of um, the toolkit that you that you have access to already, that's all already been launched. Um, there's a guide to inter intersectionality and sexual harassment within the workplace. And really what it's been designed to do is cover three main points. What is intersectionality and um, the whole frameworks? And it, it's a massive theory, ideology, I suppose, um, and the popularity of it is increasing, which is fantastic. Um, but I, I guess it's still in its early days um, of being implemented within workplaces um, and within workforces. So the second um, thing that it was designed to do was to describe why it's relevant to the workplace. And the third was um, why it's relevant to sexual harassment in the workplace. But all of the information that I'm going to be covering today will be available and um, it well, is available in the guide and the toolkit and um, you'll also be able to access the slides after uh, to refresh your memory uh, in your own time. So before we start to jump in to look at what intersectionality is, um, I thought that it would be useful just to take a step back and think about the context that we're operating in um, at the moment. And as I'm sure that you're all aware, the focus on equality and diversity um, is rapidly increasing. Uh, workforces, workplaces, um, it, they're really embedding different initiatives, different policies and different efforts to really make sure that when as employees we're at work, we're protected and we feel safe. And um, things that affect us, we can speak um, when they concern equality and diversity. And organisations and businesses are reassessing their approach to ensuring equality of opportunity within their workforces. Um, and uh, these are things, uh, and when I refer to, to, to policies or examples, um, I mean things like anti-racist policies, 
to tackle racism, um, gender pay gap reporting, uh, disability confidence schemes is another example. Um, and they're fantastic bespoke support for those individual marginalised groups um, that kind of aim to improve their culture and to make sure that different people within the workforces are protected. So what employers can do uh, is utilise the information provided in the Equality Act 2010 and the Northern Ireland, or Northern Ireland Act 1998 to really understand um, some examples of what inequalities still exist today. Um, and these are the kind of nine protected characteristics which you can see on the screen there. But while the focus on equality and diversity for different characteristics is increasing, which is fantastic, we asked the question, how does this affect an employee in an employee who has more than one um, characteristics which puts them at a disadvantage in the workplace? And this, in fact, is where intersectionality comes into play. So what is intersectionality? Um, it's essentially a framework that recognises and considers how everyone has their own individual experience of discrimination and oppression and that oppressions in all forms do not follow a universal hierarchy. So essentially the framework or theory or ideology, I suppose, are mechanisms to look at how somebody's multiple identities interact. And by this, we're referring to things like race, things like ethnicity, sexual orientation, religion, disability, and what happens when an individual who belongs to these two groups um, faces a form of inequality. And whilst um, I've just mentioned the Equality Act and the Northern Ireland Act, um, they're a great place to start to think about how this framework can be applied to our lives. But intersectionality can be applied to a range of identities. So, for example, somebody's class or uh, socioeconomic background or status could impact um, how a person's experience within the workplace could, can create that additional layer of disadvantage for somebody already for um, facing a form of inequality. So um, the term and the framework was introduced by Kimberly Crenshaw uh, in the late 80s. She was looking into the overlapping issues experienced specifically by black women in the law and wider society. Um, and, and she's done lots of work and you can easily find her TED talk. She's a fantastic advocate um, for, for race theory and, and gender theories, um, I suppose. But while she looked at it at kind of in isolation to start off with in terms of the law and wider society, the framework and its influence and impact has since rapidly uh, kind of been rolled out uh, on a global scale, I uh, global scale. Um, and it's really starting to influence and, and I suppose be a fantastic helping hand to those organisations that are taking that step to make sure that equality, diversity and inclusion and everything that falls underneath it is really being rolled out um, and actioned in an authentic way, which makes sure that nobody um, nobody misses out and an element of somebody's identity isn't ignored. So as we've just touched on, uh, the term can be applied to a range of characteristics um, and identities. Uh, and an important part of the framework uh, is that it naturally opposes that one size fits all solution to tackling inequalities and values. Um, and, and what it does, sorry, is value the nature of individuality and the uniqueness dependent on somebody's situation. Um, and as I'll be saying lots today, it's really useful for employers to adopt to increase their ability to better ensure um, equality and diversity within their workplace. So why is intersectionality relevant to the workplace? Let's have a think about um, this in isolation. When an organisation recognises that individual employees, clients, audience members, service users have multiple identities which shape their experience in society and work um, and the world, its ability to better ensure inclusion uh, and equal opportunities can rapidly improve. And by recognising and applying an intersectional approach, and by this I mean uh, things covering uh, internal behaviours, systems, the general attitudes of the organisations, um, the way that line managers or senior leaders are equipped to deal with situations which may concern equality and diversity and, and that kind of space of things. So we'll just move on. 
So I'm going to give you an example um, of two employees within uh, the workplace. So we've got employee A, Denise, who is um, a black woman and has a disability, and Kelly, employee B, is a white woman and does not have a disability. So whilst uh, these two female employees may experience uh, similar forms of discrimination and oppression as a result of their gender, Denise is also subjected to inequality because of her race and disability and it's important that their employer can recognise the differences between their situations and ensure that they're able to address the circumstances where more than one of, um, form of inequality occurs. So as we looked at earlier, anti-racist policies, gender pay gap reporting or disability confidence schemes um, would support individuals who belong to one of these groups. But these initiatives may not always be uh, truly able to protect and ensure those at the center of our Venn diagram here, um, just kind of in this space where all of those identities are overlapping um, and creating a, a unique experience that um, can't, I, I suppose, be experienced by others within the workforce um, and a re really interesting kind of quote that I found um, from an anonymous source online which I think fantastically explains um, what intersectionality is and it says if I'm a black woman I have some disadvantages because I'm a woman and some disadvantages because I'm black but I also have some disadvantages specifically because I am a black woman which neither black men nor white women have to deal with and that's intersectionality, race, gender, and then every other way to be disadvantaged um, and how they interact with each other. Um, so that's I, that's a specific example on gender, race, and disability. But of course, as we um, as I mentioned earlier, it really can affect um, different forms of identity, and especially within the workplace, uh, it, it's quite a, an important thing as well to. Think about the position uh, in terms of your job role. That's another form of power, again, which may influence uh, in a professional context. So moving on, why is intersectional intersectionality relevant to sexual harassment in the workplace? Uh, ultimately, intersectionality recognises that certain structures can position individuals to be more powerful. So that's less likely to be discriminated against or oppressed or less powerful, more likely to be discriminated against or oppressed. And we know that power dynamics influence everything in our lives. And we also know that this doesn't stop at work. So employers should consider how an employee's multiple identities can have an impact on a situation concerning discrimination or harassment to ensure an element of their unique experience um, isn't ignored. And what the framework does is it really helps us to understand the range of unacceptable acts that tend to fall under the banners um, of sexual harassment that are experienced by different um, individual people. And those who are uniquely marginalised, um, and again we're thinking about those with two or more uh, protected identities or identities which are kind of uh, with an increased likelihood to face uh, oppression, discrimination, um, but they can experience harassment that targets more than one characteristic. And when this happens, um, as I'm sure we're all aware, and if we just heard from Sarah and her kind of quite hard hitting examples, it can be harmful and create a really hostile environment um, where employees don't feel safe and protected. So, for example, a young Muslim woman may face discrimination or harassment, which simultar simultaneously targets her age gender, religion and ethnicity and that's going to place her in a really distinctive and vulnerable position at work and that's where employees need to be um, active in looking out for those intersect intersecting issues of harassment um, and really utilise this, this idea uh, and framework of what intersectionality is. So um, I think that you've seen these uh, stats a couple of times today, I know Joe touched on them. Um, but I really wanted to draw attention to them uh, to demonstrate ha just how interse intersection, it's always really hard to say that word, intersecting identities can impact people who have experienced sexual harassment. And I've lifted these from the um, report provided as part of the toolkit. So as we can see, 
seven in ten disabled women uh, have reported being sexu sexually harassed at work. Um, 68 percent of LGBT workers um, have also uh, reported that they've experienced sexual harassment and 63% of young women aged 18 to 24 have experienced sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, so as you can see, when um, an individual is from uh, more than one uh, kind of marginalised characteristic, it really can have an impact. And again, we go back to this idea of, of, of power um, and how individuals may take advantage of those that are really in a uniquely placed um, position to receive this uh, awful behaviour. But in addition to the figures shown on the screen, the report also provides context to why it's important to consider intersectionality within sexual harassment cases. And what it notes is how women facing multiple forms of disadvantage can be an easier target. Um, and again, that goes back to what we've uh, what I've just been talking about, that issue um, of, of power, really. So we're nearly done now, uh, and I think I'm okay for time. But um, I'm just going to cover some practical steps which you as employers uh, can take to better understand an employee's unique experience and to provide the most tailored support, um, which is going to be able to protect those employees who may um, experience uh, intersecting forms of harassment. So my kind of top point number one especially would be to gain an understanding of those current inequalities. Um, so in order to fully comprehend how intersectionality works, it's crucial to build your understanding of the different inequalities faced by different groups. So for example, as an employer, if you're aware of the impacts of racism and sexism, then you're going to be in a much better position to be able to support those who may be experiencing both of those inequalities. Um, and to make sure that uh, as an employer, you're able to take those key steps to highlight um, the, the issue in hand. My second piece of advice would be to adopt an intersectional approach throughout the organisation. So whilst it, it really is um, important in this case, as we're talking about today, to tackle misconduct concerning sexual harassment, you shouldn't just apply it uh, to one area of your organisation. So um, when I say this, I'm talking about things like equality and diversity and inclusion policies. Um, that they're a great place to start to make sure that you've got clauses and points that really highlight the importance of the framework and that you're able to communicate to staff that you're confident as an employer of tackling different forms of inequalities when they fall um, at once to an individual or group of employees and that's a fantastic kind of first step to embedding the approach. Um, my next top tip would be to incorporate a focus on intersectionality within sexual harassment training and awareness. So um, you've all got access to the fantastic toolkit that has been created in partnerships um, with the organisations that we're hearing from today. Um, but it's a complex framework and I know that I've kind of spent 10 minutes introducing or reminding you what it is, but it's really important not to assume employee knowledge um, and to be able to raise awareness levels. So by delivering internal campaigns um, and training to ensure the whole workforce understands exactly what unacceptable behaviour looks like um, when an individual has those multiple um, backgrounds which put them at a, a natural disadvantage um, to promote a zero tolerance approach to sexual and any other forms of harassment. Um, the onboarding process is a fantastic time to utilise. We all know that inductions for new staff um, and a really important time to set those expectations of behaviour. And many employers already incorporate the equality, diversity um, and inclusion training within their onboarding process for new starters. Um, but including an emphasis on intersectionality within training can be really helpful to building a workforce um, who can engage with and support the framework and its impact and understand what it, it means in practice. And then my final point with um, with 
to be uh, ensuring that line managers and senior leaders are trained and confident to handle those unique individual experiences. Um, and we know that managing people requires mutual trust and confidence in working relationships. Um, and those ma management responsibilities are often required um, to handle those really sensitive um, and often awkward, really, issues. But equipping line managers uh, and senior leaders with these skills are really go is really going to be able to allow them to access the support that they need as well um, to support their own staff when addressing uh, an intersectional uh, harassment case. So thank you very much for listening. That's it from me today. Uh, if you've got any questions, please pop them in the chat. I think I have just ran over slightly. Um, and of course, you'll be able to see my email on the screen as well. And like Sarah, I'm really happy to answer any questions or have a chat with anyone directly. But thank you very much for the very quick tour of intersectionality. Thank you, Del, and that really was a great whistle stop tour in intersectionality. And the guide is included in the toolkit. Um, it's a great guide for you to use. It's well explained, and it's you know it's really simplified for employers to be able to pick up and understand. But if you do have any questions for Della, either email Della directly or you know drop us an email, and we can pass those questions on as well. But um, if there's no questions, I will hand over to Bob for our last session of today. Thank you, Della. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bob, the floor Hi. is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Morning, everybody. Um, my name is Bob Hicks, and um, I've been asked to uh, give you some benefits of my experiences with Qualiteg and outside Qualiteg on this topic of banter versus sexual harassment. Um, this is a topic which is huge uh, and everybody's got a point of view on this, which makes it quite a, an interesting debate. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, just a quick intro. Um, I've been working with Qualiteg since 2015, uh, working with businesses on the business program to help them improve their quality diversity and inclusive practices and policies. Previously to that, um, I've worked as a senior HR professional in several large corporates uh, in several sectors in the UK, spent two years in New York with HSBC, uh, line managed up to 40 staff. So I've also had experience of being a manager myself and also run my own HR consulting business, which included experience uh, as an ex as an ACAS trained external investigator. So what I'd like to look at uh, is the differences between um, banter and sexual harassment, particularly the boundaries. I'm happy to take questions as we go or at the end. OK. It's, it's important, I think, to look at this in a balanced way. Um, banter can be positive. Um, if it's great, it can be a really great place to work. It can develop relationships in teams. Uh, it can reduce stress. And we heard from Sarah uh, about the uh, stress that officers face in doing their jobs and the effect that that's having. Um, and having done some work with the um, Met Police on helping people retiring find jobs elsewhere, um, I'm very well aware that there is a, 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 a an essential black humour which the police use to help them actually uh, get through what they have to get through. Um, it can also be something that can diffuse tension. It can really help support people working together as well. However, like all good things, if they're overdone, then they can become bad. Then banter is used quite often as a defence against accusations of bullying, harassment and discrimination. And let's not forget, many people met their lifelong partners or spouses at work. But employees need to know that there is a boundary. They need to know when they're approaching it. And more importantly, when they've crossed it. So let's make a start. What exactly is banter? This is the Oxford Dictionary definition. The playful and friendly exchange of teasing remarks. OK, let's take this apart a little bit. Who decides what is friendly and playful? 
You can only do that in practice uh, by referring to what is considered to be socially acceptable standards in the context of the culture at the workplace. And we've already heard it's all about culture. But this can vary between organisations, big ones, small ones, different sectors. It can vary within organisations between teams. It can vary between countries and religions. What if there is no exchange? What if the banter is all one way? One way traffic and targeted maybe at one particular individual. In the UK, the courts and the tribunals have the ultimate say in whether it's playful, friendly, whether it's banter, if it gets that far. OK, so anybody any comments on that? If not, I'll move on. So what is harassment? This is what how is harassment is defined in the Equality Act. Bullying and harassment can be delivered verbally, visually, in writing, or through social media. Gone are the days when we used to see page three girls in newspapers. Gone are the days when you could walk into an office and see girly calendars on the walls. That's all gone. But one thing that many employers don't always give enough attention to, it's not just about the behavior of an alleged harasser or an individual or a group of individuals. But as you can see from this definition, it's also about the work environment and the culture that the employer has created or has allowed to develop. It says here, if we look at the, the second part of this definition, um, uh, violating an individual's dignity or creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment for that individual. I've worked with some organisations, some small businesses that are entirely 100% um, male and a macho environment has developed over time and it's just become normal. Um, and they wanted some help to recruit more women. Um, and they didn't seem to get the fact that why would a woman want to join an organization with such a culture? And it took them a while to get the message. There's a clue here about where the boundary lies. It's that word unwanted or unwelcome. The Act mentions conduct related to protected characteristics. So here is just a reminder of what they are. Della covered these just now. But these are the areas, the nine protected characteristics of the Equality Act. And as you can see, there are three which specifically relate to sex. So let's have a look at some examples of what might constitute sexual harassment. These are some examples, and they are just some examples that um, uh, are defined and used by the CIPD and ACAS in their documentation and materials. Um, unwelcome remarks or jokes related to a person's gender or sex life. Unwelcome remarks. Unwelcome is the clue there as to where the boundary lies. Uh, many of us probably are, are aware of, of, of remarks or jokes that have been quite playful and maybe once or twice they've overstepped the mark. Spreading malicious rumours of, of a sexual nature which are regarded as offensive or insulting. Whether the rumours are true or not, the fact that they're being spread and it's creating a perception about that person is the problem. Ridiculing or demeaning someone, name calling, comments about appearance, what they look like, what they're wearing, privately or openly. Unwanted sexual advances. This is the one that most people tend to be able to relate to easily. Touching, standing too close, any display of offensive materials, asking for sexual favours. Worst, making decisions on the basis of sexual advances being accepted or rejected. Sexual assault or abuse. And of course, rape is included in that. Behaviour that's considered normal by one person may be considered as harassment by another. 
but these examples are considered as harassment officially by the CIPD and ACAS. I think that extreme cases of sexual harassment uh, are likely to be easier to identify, such as sexual assault, rape, threatening behaviour, abuse, where most people would tend to find or agree that the line has clearly been crossed. From these examples, the degree of impact on an individual can also be used to identify that the line has definitely been crossed. And we've heard from Sarah that some females actually leave their organisations because of the impact that such uh, behaviour has had on them. If that is a talented individual, that as an employer you really like to hang on to, then that's a real shame for all parties. That clearly is something that has to be dealt with. But if everything was black and white, we could rely on procedures and processes. Managers are valued because of the management of the grey. Because a lot of this stuff that we're talking about here, particularly banter, is open to wide interpretation, depending on the point of view that you have and the gender that you have. It's sometimes these grey areas that cause most problems and confusion with understanding where this boundary actually lies. Let's have a look at some examples of what I mean. I'd like you to think about each one of these in terms of, is this actually sexual harassment? I'm looking at someone and smiling. Some might think, come on, that's ridiculous. How could that be sexual harassment? Well, it can depend on how it's done. There's body language involved in communicating messages as well as words. If somebody is glaring or staring at someone else for a long time and smiling, maybe raising eyebrows suggestively, then maybe that could be interpreted as a form of sexual harassment. Introducing yourself to someone at the office Christmas party. That might not be a problem, OK? If you're forcing yourself, maybe you've had a few drinks and your, your tongue is a little loose in, in, in this process, Maybe a line is being crossed or is being approached quite rapidly. Quite often. Standing when, when, when we work in offices, it's not so um, uh, easy to do now when we're all working online, uh, but standing or sitting closely next to someone at their desk while explaining something on their screen, maybe a coaching session. OK, sitting closely next to somebody, maybe even the slight touching of an elbow or something of that nature. Maybe put your arm around them just to say, hey, you've got it. Well done. OK. Is that sexual harassment? Incidental physical conduct, contact or brushing past someone, but maybe doing it often enough that somebody thinks, hang on, it, this is becoming a pattern. This is deliberate, surely. Telling someone that they smell nice. Oh, I like your perfume. That's great. I would really like to know what, where you've got that from. I'd like you to wear that more often. That's great. Is that sexual harassment on its own? If it was, if somebody added, oh, I'd like to know where you've got that because I, I'd like to buy that for my wife for Christmas. Maybe that tones it down a bit. Complimenting someone on their appearance. You look great today. Oh, love the hairstyle. That's fantastic. Really nice. Oh, I like that dress you're wearing. You should wear that more often. It depends on how this is done and the context within which this is done. But most people quite like to be flattered. Most people would quite like to, to, to be complimented. One of my friends who, let's shall we say, is a mature lady, married, part of our circle of friends, and she said, Wow, she said, I'd love to be wolf whistled at my age. Making a comment or a joke with sexual innu innuendo during a mixed gender meeting online. It surprises me and we've heard some examples of how the incidence of sexual harassment has actually increased with online working. 
being done privately, maybe being done anonymously. Um, maybe it's gone undercover because it's less easy to identify because a lot of physical people are not in the same space. Need to be careful about that one. Regularly joining someone for lunch, but uninvited. OK. Now. Would that feel unwanted? If it's uninvited, would that person feel hang on? Why is this person doing this? I'm getting a bit uncomfortable. This is always happening. This is a pattern. A comment. Oh, did you see that film last night? Wasn't there a load of sex in it? On its own could be considered innocent, but if the idea is to in, is to create a conversation about sexual activity or maybe how it might have related to someone else's sex life, uh, then maybe you're crossing a line. Flirting privately or openly. As I've said before, you know, uh, people have gone on to get married and have successful uh, marriages, successful partnerships, um, and this is where it started. OK, so uh, that's something that needs to be considered as well. Continuing to joke about someone's appearance. To which that person has historically responded in a humorous way. So they've given maybe the, the impression that eh, I'm OK with this. This is a bit of a joke. That's no problem. But we've heard that there are um, lots and lots of people. Who have not reported sexual harassment. Uh, because they either do not um, uh, feel they'd be taken seriously, um, they feel alienated, they may feel excluded from the team, they might not feel like they're being treated as one of the team, they might fear for the impact on someone's career that it might have. Okay, but the fact that it is not reported or generally did, uh, responded to in this way does not mean that it's not sexually harassment. These are everyday things that we come across, not just at work, but outside work. Many of these can be open to interpretation, and, and this is just a selection of things that I've come up with, um, especially if they're one offs. But I think if we start to see a pattern here in something, a clear pattern. Then maybe a line is being crossed. If there's regularity in some of these things, like being frequently um, joining someone for lunch, but you're uninvited in the canteen such that there is these days, uh, then maybe the regularity of it is now starting to create some questions about hang on a minute. This is moving beyond banter. It's moving beyond behavior. And if it's a progression. In the behavior, it starts off looking at someone and smiling. Then you introduce yourself at the Christmas party. Then you start getting close contact with them, maybe invading their personal space from time to time. Um, and some contact and then you start telling them they smell nice. Oh, and you look great today. As you can see, there could be a progression in place which could even be called grooming um, in the behavior. Then the boundary alarm sensors should be going off for that person. Particularly if the behavior is unwanted or unwelcome. Then banter has crossed the line. But we know that people don't always make it clear that it's unwanted or unwelcome or even report it at all. As we've heard, uh, there are plenty of statistics that show that people don't report what they come up against. And only 7% of females have actually had an experience where it's, that, that the issue has been dealt with satisfactorily by their employer. And it could be that you persuade yourself this is not really happening because you really don't want to get to the point where it becomes something that has to be dealt with. So you try and put it off a bit. OK, so try and ignore it. You say, ah, oh, it's not really happening. It'll go away. Don't really mean it. I can put up with this. That's fine. OK. But sometimes the only time that it actually does become clear that it's unwanted. Unwelcome is when an informal or formal complaint is actually made. And we've heard that there ought to be more than one approach more than one process to allow people to make such an informal or formal complaint. Sexual conduct that is invited, mutual or consensual is not sexual harassment because it's not unwanted. However, as we know, things can change and sexual conduct that's been welcomed in the past 
can become unwanted in the present and the future and therefore can become sexual harassment where it was not before. So given all these everyday examples of things, you know, what's an employer to do? All the employer can do is to work on the culture. So it's quite useful to look at this from the perspective of an investigation into a sexual harassment complaint, let's say by an external investigator. If you recall, the Equality Act made reference to the work environment. Employers have a duty of care to all of its employees, future as well as present and past. That includes treating alleged harassers fairly throughout the process. The last thing an employer wants to do is to jump to major conclusions straight away. Um, and dismiss the person, the perpetrator, and then they get hit with a constructive dismissal claim because they didn't investigate it properly. That happens a lot. So establishing the facts will likely include asking some of these questions. Is there a clear policy in place which clarifies to everybody what is unacceptable behavior? What which has been communicated to everyone? And we mean a clear policy which makes things clear. Not a piece of not a principle statement that says we deplore such behavior and it won't happen here and we'll deal with it. That's not enough. It's got to be clear. People need to understand how they're expected to behave. And what will happen if they cross the line? Are there clear procedures for raising and dealing with sexual harassment complaints? But more importantly, have they been followed? There's no point having a process, policy or a document that gathers dust simply to tick a box that somebody thinks needs to be ticked. That's not what we're talking about. Culture change can start with a policy that says this is how you are expected to behave. These are our values and uh, these are the procedures to ensure that these things will be carried out and that these will be maintained and embodied in our organization in terms of the way we all work together. Many tribunals uh, have found against employers because while they've had procedures which the which the uh, and policies which the employers relied on, they've not followed them. They've ignored them in many cases. Following on from that, is there a history that shows how sexual harassment complaints are dealt with? One of the things an investigator might want to do is to talk to people that says, well, has this happened before? How has it been dealt with? And if the major answers that come back say, well, it's happened before, it's been ignored, it's been brushed under the carpet. Managers have said they didn't know how to deal with it, so they just kicked it around and, and lost it in the corner and it all gathered dust. We've lost, we've lost lots of good people because stuff hasn't been dealt with. Um, so there has to be um, some basis for saying we do this well professionally in accordance with the law and we will continue to do so. One of the problems is if an employer allows the culture to develop along certain unacceptable lines and it's starting to get out of control, then what's in place for the employer to notice that? If you're an organization with layers of managers, team leaders, supervisors, you've got a potential army there of supporters where individuals are not necessarily spying on people, but they can just notice, hang on a second, this is slightly different to what I saw last week. Or I don't like the look of, of so-and-so. They clearly, by the look of their face, did not like that comment. OK. Uh, you have to notice things. You have to deliberately want to notice things, particularly if they're getting worse or certain team behaviors are deteriorating. OK, if you don't stamp on it straight away, it will continue to allow to happen. How far does the work culture normalize unacceptable behavior? We've heard before about banter being normal in organizations and people just learning to put up with it. The culture, the values, if they're not reinforced by a good policy, 
by good procedures that are embedding things by proper professional management behavior, which looks for these things and takes action when they notice something. Um, and there's a process that allows people to raise, hang on, I disagree with that. I don't like the way that has been dealt with. And it could come from somebody who has observed it rather than the person who suffered it. Then there's a potential issue that uh, 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 an accept unacceptable bad culture will be allowed to develop. And the finger will be pointed at the managers or the employer. So this is just a sample of, of questions which um, uh, you should be looking at as employers. So, so a good start is to ask yourselves, how would I approach these things? If, if an investigator came in and looked at this stuff, how would we how would we feel? Where would we rate? Lastly, and we've heard this and uh, Joe went through this as well. Uh, is there proper training in place for people to deal with such complaints and to seek advice if they need it? Proper training, not just for managers, but also for senior people in organizations to understand how to deal with issues when it gets raised with them or managers when they deal with it every day. Sometimes you can deal with it and and, and stop a problem getting worse simply by an intervention at the time informally at the right place with the right people. And it's dead, killed. OK. Um, so proper training in, in, in managers to understand team leaders and employees as to what the boundary is here and how it crosses the line while recognizing that in some circumstances banter is acceptable um, provided it's not negative or damaging okay and of course quite would be very happy to help you in the toolkit and outside the toolkit with many of these issues that you might want to have uh, help with okay thank you for listening um, any questions Thanks for that, Bob. That was really, really helpful. And I know we can share these slides with people afterwards. Um, just waiting to see if there's any questions coming through. People thanking you for um, a really useful presentation. Uh, Wendy mentions, key takeaway for me is the need for strong and effective leadership to deal swiftly and appropriately with sexual harassment, setting the right tone, standard and clear direction of travel. Absolutely, Wendy. Um, if anybody does have any questions for us, that you think about later please just get in touch and we can answer those then if there's no further questions um, i will wrap up the session and thank you all for spending the last two hours with us i know we've given you a lot of food for thought um but the presentations are all really informative and really easy for you to digest so hopefully you found them very useful i um, just want to say a massive thank you to our great guest speakers today to bob to della to joe and to sarah as well um yeah it's been a great session lots of um people actually putting in the chat now they've really enjoyed it so thank you i'm glad you enjoyed it and thank you to our audience at home as well you know we wouldn't have these events without you so i'm really pleased that you could all join us today we are recording a session for those who couldn't make it i know that many more people did actually want to come along today um but were unable to attend so that you know that's why we've got the recording and we we'll pop that onto our, our youtube channel for you to refer back to if you need to um, yeah, so enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll hopefully see you at an event very soon. Thanks all. Take care. Bye bye.